I'm Carrie M. Barrett. I am a wife, a mom, a counselor, an author, but most importantly, as you know, a child of God. And today I have an amazing guest, one of my one of my friends who I just adore. She is a powerhouse for the kingdom, and you're going to know why in just a minute. Make sure you click subscribe and share because you're going to love her stories for God's glory. So hold on. Here's Christine at Najim. Good morning, Christine. Good morning. How are you? I am blessed. How are you this morning? Very blessed, and uh, you are a natural at this. <laughs> oh, thank you. I do love it. I love it indeed. You got that personality. Thank you, awesome. and your personality too. I love you. You are, like I said, a powerhouse in the kingdom and in real estate and in business. This is your thing. So, Christine, tell everybody who you are and what you're doing. I am Christine uh, Najem, and uh, I am in Worcester. Uh, we have a business in Worcester. A real estate business that God called us to, and we really use our business as a platform to bring God's light out there. You know, we we call it marketplace ministry. This is something I'm, my husband and I are very very passionate about, and we've been doing it for probably over uh, for about seventeen years, sixteen years now. Wow, so, I didn't know it was that long. We're going in our ninth year, but prior to that, we were we were dabbling in it, but we've gone like full on marketplace. For God. So I moved here, you know, um, went to get my master's in social work and went to work at a, at a nonprofit. And one of the things that my supervisor asked me was, you know, what do you want to do? What's your, what's your ultimate goal? And really that, that uh, vision that I had that flashed before my eyes was really to be able to open a nonprofit um, to help families, especially single moms at the time. You know, my mom was not a single mom or anything, and I've never been a single mom, but for some reason, God's placed single moms on my heart and women in general. And so I realized that, you know, with that kind of income, I would never be able to achieve that. And that's how I started. Get uh, That's how I got into real estate. I figured I could start it part time. Who knows? You know, it was I didn't even know what God was going to do with it or anything like that. I just thought, hey, every you know, it's a great market. I'll just try it. Yeah. And I did. I got my license, worked part time and eventually transitioned to full time. Um, and that was 2005. Um, and, you know, met Charbel, did our thing, got married, had family. And then in 2013 was when God called me to become a broker um, and, and own a brokerage. And so. you've been really successful um, and blessed. Everything you're doing, God's hand has been on. Yeah. I mean, you know, when he called me and, and really I say when calling, it is, it was a calling for me because I was very comfortable, you know, we get comfortable in, in our place. Um, and I was working with Charbel in, in the construction. So I was doing everything behind the scenes and he was, you know, he was the front guy. And I, I just remember praying the year before the call, I heard the calling. Um, I started praying. I'm like, God, I, I, I don't there's got to be more than this for me. You know, I love what I'm doing, but there's got to be more to this. I, I want to do something to make a difference. And so 2013 rolls around early, early 2013. And I hear this whisper, you know, to start a brokerage. But mind you, I had, I had hung my license because the last real estate fallout, you know, it just left a really bad taste in my mouth. So I didn't even want to do real estate. So that's how we got into construction. And, um, you know, and, and around 2012, my husband started saying, hey, you should start your brokerage. But, you know, <laughs> that's my husband. And I'm like, no, I'm not doing it. Got too much going on. Got, you know, two toddlers and a business, a husband. We just can't do it. And so when 2013 came I, and I heard that voice, I'm like, oh, no, <laughs> you know, I don't want to do it. So I was really running away from the calling and I gave God every excuse not to do it. I don't have my broker's license. I don't, you know, I can't do it. I'm so busy. Um, but he just kept nudging, you know, like God, how he is. He's just so gentle and so loving. And um, he nudged and then he started painting the vision of why he wanted me to start this brokerage. And he took me to Ezekiel, you know, about the, the dry bones. And he was showing me that from the last fallout, the last real estate fallout, that there were so many dry bones. And when he was talking about dry bones, he, was, he wasn't just talking about people in general. He was actually talking about some of the Christians, you know, that, that we, like we, my husband and I went through it too, where we bought 
properties and, you know, things happen and every, you know, people ended up in foreclosures and that was impacting ministries. And I, you know, I was not really even aware of this, but in hindsight, this is all I'm seeing um, is that it was impacting ministries because pastors were losing their homes and, but yet they were still, you know, on the pulpit trying to preach their best, but their minds are, you know, not there because they're worried, you know, they're, they're, financial, their home was collapsing, their marriages were collapsing. And so once I answered the call, once I was obedient, God just put everything in place. It was like so easy. Mm -hmm. You know, when God calls you to do something and it's him and you obey, he just, he makes it so easy. And so he, the company was formed and actually my first two clients were actually pastors, the exact thing. They were in that position and they needed to get out of it. And so we did, we, you know, God had brought someone to me prior to, to meeting the pastors and taught me about short sales. So they were in a, in a foreclosure situation, but we were able to do a short sale, meaning they had to sell their house, but they didn't owe what was the difference, you know, between what they owed the bank and what the house was worth. So the money they owed were, was forgiven instead of having to owe 50,000 to the bank. So that really took a load off of them. And from that point on, I just really, I just saw God's hands on everything that we were doing. Yeah, And you weren't doing it. I mean, you were doing it for you, obviously, because you have to make money and you're for your family Mm -hmm. and so forth. But your focus was kingdom minded even then. And I know you're very kingdom minded. Now, how has God, you know, highlighted that for you, that kingdom mindset? When, you, you know, when you pray and ask God to open doors and he opens doors and he answers prayers and he's healing people in front of you and he's blessing people and he's doing this and that you can't help, but, um, your faith just increases, you know? So I feel like my faith from the time that we opened Cedarwood until now has grown a thousand fold, you know, because of what God has allowed me to see and, and all his promises. And the one thing that I learned throughout is that, you know, God, you know, my, my favorite scripture is God is not a man that he should lie. He's not us. He's not human. So when he makes a promise to us, when he calls us to something, he will fulfill it in his time, not in our time. We tell everybody he owns this business. He owns everything. So he owns our business. He owns our home. He owns our children. He owns that. That's how we live. And so, you know, during this, these nine years, I've just seen his hands on us, even when we were being hurt by people, even when people were slandering us, even when, you know, things were, weren't going our way, we just saw his hands over us. And so that really increased my faith throughout. And then just to see the people he, he was bringing to the company and how they were, they were coming, not because of the commission, but they were coming because of the mission. And that's how we coined the term mission over commission. I love that phrase. It is wonderful. Thank you. It was Holy Spirit inspired sitting in a, in a meeting at Pastor Will Almeida's church um, on Piedmont. That was when the Holy Spirit just downloaded that, that uh, hashtag for me. And that's been, you know, since I think 2017 has been our, our motto ever since. Right, right. And it's been um, kind of the way what you built on with the Lord. Um, who, who were you? I mean, you said you, you were a mom, you know, got some kids. Uh, what was, what was your history, Christine? Where did you start out? Did you know Jesus and walk with him from the get go? So, um, I was born in Vietnam and I grew up in a Baptist family. So we we're Baptist, but I never knew the Holy spirit. Like I knew God, I knew, you know, the, the normal prayer, the, you know, our father, you know, I just never knew the Holy Spirit. And so I kind of fell away from, from the religion, you know, I fell away from God for a while in my, it wasn't until God took me from Hawaii, removed me from there and moved me here that I really got to know him, got to know him, got to know the Holy Spirit and really had my own relationship with him. And that, I think that was in my early thirties. It wasn't any, you know, in my twenties, I was, I was completely lost. I was in the wilderness. So when people ask me, well, why did you leave Hawaii to come to, you know, to new England where it's cold and snowing half the year? I, I didn't know how to answer that 
before other than I'm crazy. But now when people ask me, I say, well, for it's because God needed me here. God wanted me here. Because if he didn't bring me here, I don't think I would be here. I wouldn't even know what marketplace ministry was. Right. And it was sometimes God has to take you out of Egypt, <laughs> you know, out of your homeland and, and take you to, to a different place so that he can prepare you. Right. So, And you didn't yeah. know there was a better way of doing all the things you were doing. You certainly no. would have not. You would not have met Charbel. No. Uh, so <laughs> things would be very, very different. Very different. Yep. So yeah. what, were there some turning points in the midst of that, Christine, which were really, really important? I think for me, the, it was those times where we were failing. You know, it was those moments of failures, of um, things that happened that weren't even our fault. And being able to see how God was there for us, that really solidified my walk with him. Um, Charbel and I got married and, you know, Charbel grew up Catholic in Lebanon. So once we got married um, and I was pregnant with CJ, that's when we said, you know what, let's give our family a chance. Let's really, let's really bring our family to God and, and see what this God thing is like, you know, be having God as the center of our, our family. Um, and when we did, to, to be honest, when we did all hell broke loose, mm. literally, you know, that was when you know, we lost our home and, and a, a lot of things happened and we look at it and we're like, my goodness, is this what it means to follow Jesus? You know that, but looking back now, I would not, I would do it all over again, all over again, you know, because be, if it wasn't for those moments, we wouldn't have been on our knees. And if we weren't on our knees, we wouldn't have seen the, the, the miraculous, the, um, the restoration that God did for us as individuals and then as a as husband and wife. Um, so those to me, the defining moments in my life and, and where it strengthened my relationship with God was in those trials. Uh, what would you share with people that are going through their own trials, Christine, that are kind of like, oh, I'm out. This is too much for me. You know, I would say, ask God. I mean, even if you don't believe that there's a God, even if you don't think that there's a God, try it. You know, what, what is, what are you going to lose by saying, Hey, help me, God, you know, help me. And when you just say those words, you know, God already wants to, to make us whole, but when you say it, now you're engaging him. And so when you engage him, he starts to bring the right people into your path and the right circumstances and situations. So if somebody's going through this time right now, whether you're a believer or not, you know, cause we hear non-believers even saying, you know, help me God and stuff, whether they believe it or not, that's another thing. But my advice is just to say, help me God. Basically, when you say that you're activating his power to say, you know what, you're opening that door for me, I'm coming in. And that's really when God shows up. Right. And did you experience, I know I experienced this, there's a difference between help me Jesus and help me Holy Spirit. That Holy Spirit, when you invite him in, he yeah. really is the comforter. He really is the helper and the guide and the counselor on all those things. How was that for you? It was a little uncomfortable for me in the beginning because, you know, you, you hear about God growing up as a child and you were never, I was never taught about the Holy Spirit. So even saying the Holy Spirit in the beginning was kind of uncomfortable for me. But as I grew, as I learned, and as the people around me started teaching me about the Holy Spirit and his role and everything, it became like second nature. Um, but in the beginning, for a lot of people, I think, you know, understanding the Holy Spirit and Jesus and, and the God, the Father, that's, you know, that's something I think people learn as they walk with, with him. But yes, absolutely. The Holy Spirit is my comforter, you know, and I'll, Jesus, you know, I'll, I'll write journals and I'll, I'll say, dear Papa, dear daddy, there's just so many words to describe him because that's who he is to us. And it's the relationship with him. I know Christine, mm -hmm. that most people don't know, or maybe some do that you're, you're a prayer warrior. I mean, you've yeah. been through on your knees praying. You yeah. said, I think you said you have a, a, a war room in your office. Yes, I do. Yep. That's awesome. Yeah. And, you know, when I, uh, when God first called me to open Cedarwood, I, honest to God, did not know 
how I would even run a brokerage. I didn't even know anything about running a real estate brokerage, you know? So I spent a lot of my time in my prayer room every morning. Um, when I come in, that would be where I, I would be. And I would, you know, have my little candle and my Bible. And I, one of my friends gave me a tally. So I have it in there. And I just been the first, you know, like from I get in around 7 30, 8 o'clock, I'll be in there till nine, sometimes 9 30. And sometimes people are like, or I'm thinking, well, how am I going to get work done? But I realize that I get more work done when I spend that time with him than if I just come in and rush and try to do things. And it's incredible. It's like you hear that, but you don't understand it until you actually do it. So I spent, I spent a lot of time in there um, with him helping me to develop strategies to grow the company. You know, I'd have my journal there and I'll, I'll hear things like I'll hear him say, okay, do this, do that, do that. And I'll do it. And that's, we're here nine years later, you know? And you, um, you did something neat. You deeded your company over to the Lord. Can you share that? Yeah. So again, (laughs) the, when, when everything hit the fan for us, we went to connect, uh, it's Connect now. I think it was Metro West Church uh, with Pastor Derek Fry and, and Stacy, And they had a crown financial class that Charbel and I decided we needed. We really needed help at the time because our finances were upside down. We owed so much money, credit card companies, all of that, because we, Charbel had been investing in real estate and been doing rehab. So we, you know, we would use those things to, to pay for materials and stuff. Anyways, we took Crown Financial, and one of the things we learned through Crown was that um, you, God owns everything. Even this phone we have, it's his. That's how, that's how I look at it, even down to my glasses. But anyways, and they taught about deeding, your biz- deeding things over, um, including your business. So that's what happened. We, with Capstone, my husband's construction company, we started with that. We deeded that company over. And through that company, he did a lot with, with the men. You know, he, he worked with a lot of um, uh, contractors, subcontractors. So, you know, a lot of them are, you know, addicted to drugs or whatever. And they have to go to work to make ends meet and to pay for their next drink, you know. But he really used Capstone to minister to, to some of these men. And some of them actually ended up going to church ended up getting baptized. So he did, you know, that was his thing. And so God said, okay, now you got to do this. So we deeded our company and everything under it. So, so when people, you know, I've had people over the last four, four years where brokers would come to us, you know, the big name brokerages would come and say, Hey, can you, you know, why don't you just bring your company under our umbrella and, you know, you can, do whatever, we'll do this. And I would, <laughs> you know, my husband would say, Oh, you got to kind of be gentle about that. But I would say to them, well, I can't because it's not my company to wow. sell or to take under. And they look at me like, what do you mean? You're the broker. And I said, yeah, I'm the broker. And I'm, you know, I, I, I'm the CEO, but God is the owner, you know, he's my partner. So until he allows me to do it, I can't go anywhere. I can't sell it to anyone. And they would look at me like, (laughs) you know, so I'm like, I'm either going to be bold about it. And that's how I am. You know, Charbel has a very soft approach. I have a very different approach. And sometimes I think he wants me to be like a little bit in the middle. But there are times where I feel like you just for for certain situations, you just have to be bold. If you were to talk to somebody about listening to hear God, if you're going to deed your business, you're going to deed your property or life over to God. And how do you hear, Christine? How do you hear Holy Spirit? How do you know what you're supposed to be doing? Yeah, that's interesting because I'm now doing coaching um, and I'm coaching, you know, agents and business people and stuff. And yesterday I just sat with someone and uh, one of my questions to her is, are you hearing God? And she said, no. So then I, I lead it with another question of, are you reading his word? And she said, no. And so I said, if you're not reading his word, how do you expect to hear him? Because we know God doesn't come down in an audible voice. He comes down through, you know, people that can speak to us. But for us to really, really, really hear him one-on-one, we have to be in the word. 
you know, and I said to her, I said, I'm not asking you to do anything or I'm not telling you to do anything that I don't do because I don't believe in just telling people and, and not doing it yourself. You have to practice what you preach. So every morning, I and mean, there's some mornings that I, I can't do it. So I, I miss it. And, you know, but very seldom does that happen. But every morning I get up and I, that's my first thing that I do. Cause I, cause for me, the first hour of the day is the most important, really just directs the rest of my day. But if I look at it and say, if I just dedicate half an hour to God for an hour or sometimes 15 minutes, if I just do that, I know everything else will follow, you know, and that's why I look at my family. Like the other day I was telling someone, I am, I don't know why I don't deserve it. I don't, I didn't do anything other than to just put God first and look at the blessings that are in my life through COVID. I never got sick. I never, you know, none of that. My family was protected and it's just, it's real. You got to put God first, you know? You can't just say it. A lot of people put exercise first. You know, they get up in the morning at whatever time and they'll get on the Peloton or they get on yeah. whatever. They go for a run and they know mm-hmm. that the morning is really the time to get the whole brain focused on how their day is going to go. And it's yeah. really very important to put God in that space. Yeah. And I did, you know, the beginning of this year, I because I've been working out the last year now, almost a year, and uh, I was getting up at four to do my scripture and then do my exercise at five. But then I got, then four was a little too early. So I'm like, you know what? I can't do this. So I said, you know what? God needs to come before anything else. So I ended up switching it to where I do um, my devotions in in the morning. And then I just do my exercise at night, you know? So there's, we have choices that we make. And so that was my, my choice. So now one of your other choices you've made is, is to disciple people. And in, mm. in your company and people outside of your company, how did you make that decision? And what's that like? I think uh, when I really understood my mission, um, you know, which is to love the Lord, to love others, and then to disciple. And that's, that's really what it's all about, you know, because I feel like if I can just bring one person to the Lord and I go and face him, I will hear him say, you know, well done my good and faithful servant. And that's all I want to hear because he's not going to ask me, well, how many houses did you sell? You know, how many houses did you flip or buy or anything? He's not going to care. He already, those things he's already given us, but he's going to want to know how many people did you steward well when I brought to you? You know, sometimes people will say, well, why are you spending so much time with that person? They're not even producing. Well, it's not about producing because God's already provided for me you know, so my, my desire in my heart has always been to help women. So now he's giving me this, how can I not steward them? And if I, and I understand the principle of sewing, which is if I continue to sew into the people he brings, he'll continue to provide for me. So it's a win-win, you know? Right. And now you're sewing into women in financial Mm -hmm. training. Is it training? Financial literacy. Yep. Yeah. And uh, through your office, people that work for you. Is there yes. a specific guide that you use for that? How would you share for people in business that want to do that or, or not in business that want to do that? How, how would you go about that? Well, over the years and especially over during COVID, I saw a lot of things that, um, you know, I came from, I come from a family where my dad is the sole uh, uh, financial person you know he knows everything about their finances my mom doesn't know anything and that's kind of the generation too but I look at it and I said well if anything should happen to my dad what would my mom do if I'm not around to help she wouldn't know what what bank accounts what how much bills are she completely doesn't know and that really bothered me um and so you know with Charvel and I I I know you know where things are and if anything needed I you know I would know all that because I made it a point to do it. And during COVID, what I was seeing, uh, you know, when I go on Facebook, I would see a lot of um, GoFundMe and people were GoFunding me for funeral, you know, the funeral costs. And I'm thinking that's very sad. And we have one of our agent who five of her family members died 
during COVID, just last year. And I mean, this woman has a phenomenal story. I'm, I'll have to introduce you to her. Um, and none of them had life insurance. None of them had any kind of savings and they didn't have any, you know. So instead of leaving a legacy for their family, they were, they had left debt, you know. And so I said, I, I don't ever want to do that. I never want my kids to have to carry my debt. I want to leave a legacy for them. And I don't want other families to go through that too, because, you know, it's just, that's just not how, who God is. You know, we treat God like he owns, he, he, we, he lives in a box or he owns just in a little apartment. So we're so afraid to ask him for anything. But when we know and understand he owns everything, we, we can ask him and he will provide. But, but the one thing that I have to say with that is for us to receive the blessings that we're hoping for, we have to first believe, but we will have to also cooperate with God. You know, um, so what we're doing in the financial literacy is one teaching women and, you know, giving them the tools to um, cut off all their debt, you know, learn to become debt free um, tools to build their credit so that they can become investors. Because in this world we live in without credit, you can't be an investor unless you have cash. Right. You and I both know that. Um, and then we're teaching them how to, to save and budget. So in the course, we have three, three, uh, three categories that we go over with them. So it's the tools we give them. But the beautiful part of what we're doing, and this, again, is another calling from God that he called us to do this year, early on in January, actually the first day of January. This was the vision he gave me. The, the beautiful part of all this is we're not just giving them tools and then letting them leave. We're helping them to, to change their mindset. You know, it's the transformation of the mind. So we have um, Diane who talks about social emotional because a lot of the spending that women do comes from a hurt, comes from fear, comes from something. It, it just doesn't, we don't just grow up and, you know, want to spend money and go into debt. It's either learn from their previous, you know, from their parents or something passed down. And then in the end, we have a pastor that, you know, talks about the mental health part of it. Um, so she's a mental health counselor. So she talks about how your mental health dictates your spending habits and everything too. But then she closes it with, you know, calling all the women to the front and praying over them and breaking off fear, breaking off anxiety. I mean, it's like, it's like a church service, you know, but really so fruitful and, and full of meat um, for women. So when they left, it was just like, there was a young girl that uh, was suicidal mm. that was broken off her. It was just so many beautiful things. And since then, all of the women that are on the, um, the, the leaders, they've been getting calls from, you know, these women. So I've been getting calls from people that are interested in building a business. And, you know, so all of us have been able to stay in our lane um, and help these women where they're at, you know, because everybody's different. Yeah, I love the stay in your lane because God, or really, he's been showing me that it's important that we do that. Like what, what he designed us for, Yes, he, he has a purpose for that. It's like we're arrows and he knows that we're going to hit our exact target and nobody else's, right? Yeah. Can you talk about identity? Because I know you and I had talked about how identity is, is so important, how we mm -hmm. understand who we are uh, as children of God and who we are not. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and again, that comes with reading the word that comes with hearing God say to us who we are and telling us who we are. Um, you know, I grew up for a long time. I think even into my 30s that I didn't know who I was. This young lady that I'm coaching right now, we're working on identity because when I asked her, who are you? She can't even say who she is because the the hurts and the pain and you know, all the things of life have really jaded, you know, has, has skewed her view of who she is. And then that leads to insecurities and unworthiness and all of that stuff. So identity in Christ is so important. And that's what we're trying to teach women, you know, at these, at these workshops is to teach them that your identity is not in the clothes you wear. It's not in the makeup you wear. It's not in the, in, in your nails or the, 
what curses you carry. Your identity is in Christ. And so we can teach them how to see themselves as Christ sees them, then, you know, then they'll be able to not like, like we talked about earlier, you know, I, I get this big commission and I don't even need to go buy anything because I know my identity. I don't need to go out and, and spend $5,000 on a purse just to make me feel good. You know, I already know who I am, but it just didn't happen. It was a, a progression and over time of learning and praying and crying and crying out to the Lord, you know, so that deliverance. Me, deliverance. Yes. Deliverance is huge, um, which a lot of churches don't teach or do. And I think that's, um, that's a step that we really miss. And so deliverance. So part of the workshop is deliverance in the end. So I think that was what happened with that young lady. She was delivered of the suicide spirit. Right. And so those things can take people kind of captive in their life. Mm -hmm. I should say kind of very captive in their lives and change their identity, who they think they are and what they think they can and cannot do. You were saying something about the, I don't remember if you said it was the bar, Christine, but how far you thought you could go and Mm -hmm. what that meant to your life. Can you share a little bit about that? Yeah. So generational you know, the generational patterns are so real. And I never knew that as a Baptist, I never heard about anything generational, anything. Um, You know, but I real, I realized not too long ago, actually last early last year, or a couple years ago, that I had put a cap on myself. And it was because it wasn't because, you know, I wanted to, it was because I had heard over the years when I was younger, from my parents that, hey, the American dream, you're living the American dream. You, you know, you, you come here to America, you work hard and you, you work a nine to five job, get a nine to five job. If you're not going to go to college, get a nine to five job, make sure you have, um, you know, make sure you have a uh, health benefits and, and 401k and all that. And so when I did that, when I got out of high school, I didn't go to college right away. I kind of took college classes here and there, but I wanted to make money to, you know, to be able to just live. Um, so I did, I, I got a really nice job as a legal secretary, you know, worked at a big law firm and they gave me benefits and everything. And my parents are so proud and, you know, they're like, Oh, you're working at a law firm. It's very prestigious. And, you know, you have all these benefits, make sure you stay there, make sure you do everything you can to keep that job. And I was making about 38,000 at the time, 35,000 at the time. Um, in my twenties and back then that's a lot of money, you know? So, uh, so I had believed from hearing my parents tell me over and over and over again, that that's, that's all you need to do. That's your cap. You know, if you can make this, you're wonderful. So I did. So even after I got my college degree, my master's degree, got out and did real estate and worked with my husband, you know, the money we made, I attributed to him making it. I didn't see it as me doing it. And he would have to remind me, you're, you're the one bringing in this income too, not just me. But I was just like, nope, I, I made it. I made my 35, 40. That's enough. You know, that's all I am contributing. And then a couple of years ago, I sat there and I'm looking around and I see all these realtors, um, you know, and along the way, my income was increasing, but I didn't even think about it a couple of years ago. When I sat around, I saw all these realtors doing million dollar deals. And I sat there one day, I'm like, God, why not me? You know, why not me? Because you know that my heart is to build your kingdom. And if I get to be able to make more money, you know where that money's going to go. So why not me? And I started praying and asking him. And then he started showing me that I'm going to take that lid off of you. And I'm thinking, what lid? I didn't even realize I put a lid on me. And so last year, I purposely, like, purpose. (laughs) I started praying and saying, God, take that lid off of me, take that lid off of me and give me my first million dollar deal God, I've worked, you know, I've had my license for how long, been a broker for how long, never done it in a million dollar deal. You know, I got to eight, seven, 800. So a few months after I really started praying that circling that in my journal, I got a, not just a million dollar deal. I got a $2.6 million deal and not just one side, God gave me both sides. And so I was just, I was floored and I didn't realize it till after everything was put under, under contract and everything that 
God is so amazing. You ask him for something, he doubles it for you. He just, he wants to show off. And he took the lid off of me, you know, to show me that, that, that what he has for me is so much more than what I wanted for myself or what I thought I was capable of. So since then, I just closed on that deal a couple of weeks ago. Um, I have a copy of my, my first commission check and, um, you know, for that size of a deal. And since then, when I pray for women, I, I pray that God takes the lid off of them, you know, because I learned, too, that the any anointing that God gives you for business, for, you know, raising children or whatever it is, you can pass it on to someone. Right. You can pray that over someone so it cancels out everything else that's been spoken over them. So that's what I do now is that I pray, you know, that God will take the lid off of these women financially you know, with their marriage, with their, with everything, but more for me, it's more for in the business realm. Right. And the lid doesn't have to be just financial, right? I mean, it can, the lid can be on anything. I think I've talked to you about like It can be in a relationship, how young ladies are like, well, I can only accept this kind of guy because that's mm-hmm. who I you know, expect. Yes. Wherever. Yeah. Wherever. Yeah. Wherever. And because we're the daughters of the most high. You know, our father is the king. We should be princesses. We shouldn't be peasants. <laughs> you know, we shouldn't live like we're, we're, we're taking scraps. We should live as if we're sitting at the table with the king. Right. You know, it's, he, not, it's not just financial. It's overall. No, it's overall. All things. Yeah. Overall things. Yeah, absolutely. Wow. Thank you, Christine. And so right now you're working on training women in finance. You've mm-hmm. got Cedarwood Realty, Cedarwood Foundation. What else is on your plate? <laughs> Honestly, I was just telling Charvel yesterday, uh, last night, I said, I finally feel like I'm where God needs me to be. I'm beyond what I imagined I could be. And so anything from here on is a bonus, um, you know, even speaking, um, public speaking and stuff, he's this year, he's opened doors for me to do so much more of that, which he knows I'm not a fan of, but I'm, you know, he's given me more boldness this year and, uh, wherever he takes me, you know, I'm getting invitations to go and speak to the kids at the, uh, uh, youth Worcester youth center, teaching them about um, you know, how to become a, a real estate agent. But the beautiful part of all of this, what I get to do is even though I'm teaching them that stuff, I bring God with me everywhere. Mm-hmm. So I'm teaching people to, you know, if you want to open a business, let's open a kingdom business. Let's not just open a business, you know, because that's the only way we can transfer the wealth of the world into the hands of his children. And then that's how we can help move agendas you know, forward, you know, fighting sex, tra- uh, sex trafficking, sex education, uh, abortion, all of that, these, all these things need money. And so for me, marketplace ministry isn't just about money, it's about taking the money that God's allowed you to make, and pouring it into his kingdom, pouring into the, the work that's being done out there by people that are, you know, doing amazing things, but need help. You know, because a lot of these ministries that you see out there, Fellowship of Christian Athletes, Teen Challenge, you know, uh, Net of Compassion, all these people, they need the funding there and, and churches, you know, pastors are there to to pastor churches there. They shouldn't be pastoring churches here and then working full time just to make ends meet for them, because in the week that they're not, you know, on the pulpit on Sundays, they're running to to pray for somebody. They're going to the hospital to do something. They're doing weddings. They're, they're doing so much more than what people see. Um, but yet when we need something, who's, who are the first people we go to or call our pastors for prayers, but the same way we will go to them for prayers, we should bring to them as with our tithing too, so that we can help the body of Christ. Right. It really is a cycle. And we don't Mm -hmm. often think, I think many people actually think that, Oh, it's the charity will take care of it. Mm-hmm. You know, but who takes care of the charity? Where does that money come from? And if we are putting money into the kingdom, it'll come out into the kingdom yes. and out into the world for what the world needs freedom from and help for. Mm-hmm. Absolutely. Yeah. And I mean, especially the last two years, you and I, we have the same uh, philosophy, you know, the same outlook of life is we've seen how 
so many things that are against God's will, you know, for, for, for um, those things are being pushed forward. Because when you really hear about the people that support them and the money, where the money are coming from, these are big, giant companies, you know, that are doing that. And then you have the, the little people like us here that we barely can make, you know, help to push one agenda forward. So that's, that's my passion right now. And Charbel's passion is to help build kingdom businesses because we, and when you become a kingdom business, when you really dedicate your business to God, don't just do it for, so that you can profit. You have to understand that we're helping you to do this, not so you profit. We're helping you to do this so that you build with us in the kingdom. But if you decide that it's only for your gain, I can, I would venture to say that, that, that business won't be long lived. And the only reason why we're in, you know, long lived uh, to this point is really because we do honor him through what we do. Consistently, consistent honor, consistent bringing it forward, yes. consistent yeah. devoting it to him. Do you, can you share, um, you and I worked on a project called the Nisi Project, and yes. that was about kingdom business and dedicating your business to the kingdom and standing for that. Can you share a little bit about the Nisi Project and what it stands for, how you came up with that um it was a project that came right when covid started and um but it was a vision that i that god had given me probably a year before covid started um when i drove by a church and i saw you know a, a flag outside the church and it really sat in my heart you know because i just felt like you know we need to see god's flag everywhere we need to see him represented. I, uh, so he, he just gave me this vision of, you know, bringing people together under his flag, under his umbrella um, to be unified, especially in a time where it's going to be needed. And I didn't know that when he gave me the vision that COVID would ever hit because the COVID season was one of the, the most divisive seasons we've seen, you know, where, where people were all in their homes families divided with different opinions and countries divided. And so um, the flag was a representation of, okay, let's all come under God's flag, you know, because at the end of the day, it doesn't matter who believes what and what's right or what's wrong. What matters is the love that comes from Christ. And so we did the Nisi project um, at City Hall, you know, you, you were instrumental in helping write up all the, you know, the mission and all of that, which, um, is, is huge. So thank you for that. Um, and we did, we, we were able to go out to city hall during a time where they weren't giving permits to people to meet or gather or anything. Um, and they, we, they allowed us to do that in June. And I think once again in August, but after that, you know, we had to kind of disband because of, of how bad it was getting. But in, even in the beginning, um, we had to fight, you know, the, the city, we had to fight the officials um to be out there and we did we got out there i think the first one we had like 12 church represented we had pastors from you know 12 different churches speaking and um the life song uh a band was out there and worship was beautiful and it was it was raining on the first one but wow you just i, I think everyone could have could agree that we just felt the holy spirit we felt his presence so deeply and it was just it was beautiful yeah. you know and a lot of relationships were forged through those two events um, that we're still working together now um, because of that. Yeah, it's a coming together, especially during COVID. We were so separated that we needed to come together and have a mutual purpose. And it didn't really matter what denomination or where you yes. come from. It's just to come together under the Lord and press in for what it is that he wants to do. Yeah. Yeah. Because I think over the over time, you know, especially in Worcester, there's so many churches, but not every church, you know, not every pastor knows each other, you know, because everybody has their own thing and, you know, doing their own thing, which is fine. But I think there's got to there has to be a time where we unite as one body, um, you know, so that was that was a memorable event for me. Absolutely. Christine, as we're wrapping up today, what are some things that you would really tell people if they're like, wow, I want to do this. I don't really know how to do this. How, how could they get started? Well, I have my, um, we have next week, I have my mission driven business 
uh, workshop, you can, you know, join that. Um, we're going to talk about, I mean, and that's for women. So um, we're going to talk about how to start a business, you know, what it looks like to be a kingdom business. So I'll, I'll walk people through the steps of doing that. Um, and then, you know, if there's people that want to learn, you know, they can reach out to myself or my husband. Um, and, you know, even some of our agents right now that have been with us for, for you know, many years, they're doing it too. So, you know, there's Arellis, Cheyenne, uh, Omar, just a lot of them are now doing it so they can actually be coaching people to do it. Yeah. So mentoring and training and discipling other, it's not just you, right? It's a trickle yeah. down of how can you let the next person yes. do the same thing and teach more people and more people so we understand in the kingdom what we're doing. Yeah, and we're grabbing, we're grabbing onto our kids right now. Like Omar has his son working for him. Um, you know, and David, um, my son is working with Charbel. So we're training the next generation of kids already and teaching them about marketplace ministry. You know, my thir my 14 and 15 year old, they know what marketplace ministry is. And so um, just helping them to see that because it's it's really all about the next generation. We have to leave that legacy and we have to make sure that they carry it on, you know, and not not scare them to the point where they're going to run away from it, but engage them to the point where they're going to feel drawn and compelled to doing what we've been doing. Right. Um, so yeah. I really feel like the Lord is showing me and I think a lot of others that family and unity are really important right now. He wants to pull families together, wants to pull the churches together, wants to pull everyone together in his family, which is really was his mm -hmm. whole plan in the beginning, right? Yes. To yes. bring us all together. Yeah. Yeah. And, you know, a lot of the things that I'll talk about in in helping people, especially women owning businesses, is we need to honor. I mean, honor is a big thing. And and first honoring God, but honoring our husbands and honoring um, our neighbors and honoring our even our kids, you know, because without honor, I mean, here here's an example. You know, you, you work for somebody, you know, the world says, don't bite the hand that feeds you. Right. But with when when God brings someone into your life to help you to to grow you you don't walk away and dishonor them you know and expect that God will continue to honor you there's there's just this thing about honoring that is so important even in business that people need to understand and husband wives when God elevates you you need to make sure you stay under your husband's cover still you know you can't bypass them we're not teaching you know the the liberal uh liberal teachings of the world we're teaching yes you can be the proverbs woman you can be an investor you can be a businesswoman but you've got to do it in a way that's honoring to god to your husband you right. know and and have all of that intact because i i wouldn't have a testimony if my my house was broken i couldn't do that you know i can't teach women to start king of businesses if I'm not, you know, if I don't have a marriage here and my kids are unruly and all of that. So just trying to do our best to live in excellence. Right. It does start in the home and in your marriage. It, it, yeah. I have, I worked for someone years ago who said, God first, family second, business third. And I thought, wow, he really has something there. And I, I wasn't even walking really too much with the Lord at the time, but I knew he really had something important. So you do too. And it is very true to come under, not in a, um, because you have to, but because you get mm -hmm. to submit and that yeah. honors your husband and it raises them up and it shows them that you respect them and are willing to come under them. Now there are some unfortunate situations where that's not a healthy thing, but mm -hmm. the hope is that both are walking with the Lord and to the point where it's okay and it's good and it's healthy to do that. Amen. Amen. Ladies and gentlemen, thanks for watching. Thanks for joining me. Remember to like and share this. But more than anything, remember to share your testimony because your testimony is a story of God. Let's make him famous. Catch you next time.